please rise and we'll sing our first hymn. Welcome to worship at St. James on, don't you just love how the sun comes in on the evening? It's great. Of course, pretty soon the sun will be dark. Never mind, we won't think about that. Right now we get the sunshine. It's good. Um, for those who are watching this recording on their uh, screens, uh, we're, we're recording the 5.30 service on Saturday night because Luann, who works in the sound booth doing all this, her baby Joseph is being baptized tomorrow afternoon and uh, she needs to get ready for the big party. So that is exciting. Um, but anyway, we're here, um, we're here tonight. Um, we're here tonight to worship Christ and have Christ do his thing. That's putting it pretty mildly, but it just covers so much. His thing in us. God, thank you for that. We, let's invoke his kingdom here now, his reign over and in us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. Then let us kneel and in confidence bring our sins to him now. Holy and merciful God, we confess our sinfulness and our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have wandered from your good ways, wasted your excellent gifts, and forgotten your amazing love. Have mercy on us, O Lord, for we are sorry and ashamed for all we've done against you. Forgive our sins and help us to live in your light and walk in your ways for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Hear the good news. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save 
sinners. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us rise to sing the praise of Christ. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God. Power and riches and wisdom and strength standing to hear our Lord speak to us in the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 11th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to the little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the gospel of the Lord. Pray. We continue with the prayer of the day. Father God, there is real happiness in obeying your good commandments, but we need help. We need your help, help through Christ help to lead this, this Christian, Christian life. life. We cannot do it on our own. We weren't able to yesterday, and tomorrow will be much the same, even though we wear ourselves out with trying. Help us in such a way that we find the rest of our soul, of our, for our souls. Lead us to walk, not on our own, but in a yoke with Jesus. Who is strong like a great ox. Yet gentle and lowly in heart. Yoke to him, his strength will be there for our weariness. And his lowliness evident in place of our pride. And your goodness will be revealed through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The second reading is from, is from uh, Philippians chapter 2. So, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, 
but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Having this mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of a man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace and mercy and peace to you. From God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So this evening is the second sermon in a series we've got going on happiness. Uh, We're going section by section through the uh, book of Philippians. If you were going to go somewhere, I don't know where you'd go to do this, but if you were going to go somewhere where you could interview people and you ask them, what do you think is the path to happiness? You know, most people would say something like, oh, get an education, uh, get a job, get married, have a family, make a lot of money, retire. Something like that. That's the path to happiness. But you know, there's scads of people who have got all those things, and they're not happy at all. You know them. I know them. The Bible says something different. It says that the path to happiness is something that in your wildest idea, you're not going to imagine. The path to happiness is through humility. You say, what? How in the world would humility make me happy? Well, there's many reasons why humility unlocks true happiness and why pride is the thing that guarantees unhappiness in your life. But let me just give you one thing. Here goes. One of the greatest killjoys in life, one of the top causes of unhappiness, is conflict. Everybody agree with that? Conflict. It doesn't just make you unhappy, it wears you down. It wearies you out. 
When, I, when I'm in conflict with someone I care about, it's like I'm carrying around a ton of bricks. Not on my back, I'm carrying them in my soul, but I, I am exhausted uh, and sad. Um, quick hopeful, hope, hopeful flash before we go on. You remember what Jesus said? Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Huge promise and offer from him, but we're going to get back to that in a moment. Because everything could be going great in your life. And you have an argument with somebody you love, and all of a sudden happiness just flies out the window. If you're ever going to learn to be happy in a consistent, resilient way, you're going to have to learn how to reduce, escape, and heal conflict in your life. Because guess what? When conflict dials down, what dials up? Unity does. Harmony. And that is a happy, happy thing. Psalm 133 says how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. We're going to see that the practice of humility is the key to reducing and healing conflict in your life. Because pride is the thing that causes conflict and keeps it inflamed. And on that score, Jesus didn't only say, come to me if you are weary and heavy laden. He went on to add, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart like humble, and you will find rest for your souls. In Philippians 2, 1 to 11, Paul, the Apostle Paul, makes an eloquent appeal for unity, for harmony, and the joy coming from that. And so he entreats the Philippians to amp up humility and cast out pride. However, Everywhere, as the basis and power for doing that, he assumes that they are like this. With God. With God. In verse 1, he writes, So if there is any encouragement in Christ... Meaning, if you've experienced any encouragement in your soul from being like this with Christ, like in Christ, or any comfort or any love from the same source, any participation in the Spirit, he writes. Participation in the Spirit, that's a strong phrase. It doesn't just mean that you know something about God, the Holy Spirit, but that your spirit and soul are participating, fellowshipping, communing with the Holy Spirit. In other words, that something like this is going on inside you between you and God. Okay, so for now, just notice this. We're going to come back to the importance of this with God thing in a moment. But for now, just notice it, put it on the shelf, we'll get back to it. But what stands out and is obvious is that Paul wants to see unity and harmony among those Philippians. In verse 2 of our reading, and I'm going to be going through this basically verse by verse, he writes, complete my joy by being of the same mind And having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Now, is there something that can destroy all of that? All that harmony and one mind is unity? Yeah. Pride. What's the middle letter in pride? Same as the middle letter in sin. I. I, 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 I. Paul breaks pride down and what it looks like into three wrong attitudes, all centered on I, okay? The first wrong attitude, he he says, characterizes pride, is selfish ambition. You see that in verse 3, which says, do nothing from rivalry, also translated selfish ambition by the NIV. Um, Now, ambition, the desire to exceed, that's what it is, and there's nothing wrong with some ambition, as long as it's genuinely subordinated to the will and glory of God. What's wrong, though, is selfish ambition, or Rivalry. Gore Vidal, you know that name? Anyway, he once said, it's not enough to succeed, others must fail. By the way, Gore Vidal was strongly against Christianity. You can see it in what he says. He also said, whenever a friend succeeds, a little something in me dies. That there is an attitude 
That there, rather, is an attitude that's going to kill harmony and produce all sorts of unhappiness. The second prideful wrong attitude is self-importance, translated in our reading with the word conceit in verse 3. What's that? It's the desire for personal prestige. William Barclay wrote, prestige is for many people an even greater temptation than wealth. To be admired and respected, to have a platform seat, to have one's opinion sought, to be known by name and appearance, even to be flattered, are for many people most desirable things. But you know, to people looking on, uh, self-importance is uh, very unattractive. And there's a certain a relief in seeing such self-important, you know, self-declared VIP types uh, deflated. I heard a story, it comes out of England, about a man who was full of his own self-importance, and he got irritated by what he considered to be incompetent service from his new steward at his club. Do you know who I am? He thundered. No, sir, was the reply, but I will make inquiries and then come back and let you know. <laughs> the opposite of such pomposity is the humility that Paul urges when he says, Count others more significant than yourselves. Count others more significant than yourselves. Humility doesn't mean we have to necessarily consider everybody else to be more gifted than we are. You know, you might be really gifted at something. You don't have to deny that. Venus Williams is not required to pretend that the person uh, behind her in the checkout line is a better tennis player than she is. That would be false humility. But what we are required to think is that others are more important than ourselves. This is the opposite of self-importance. The third wrong prideful attitude is self-centeredness. Being concerned only with ourselves and with our own interests. Paul says in verse 4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Self-centeredness is, is the heart of the human problem. Martin Luther described fallen humanity as man curved in on himself. See, we, we were created by God to be open, open to God, open to others, radically open. But sin has bent and twisted me, caused me to be curved in on myself, all my interests on me. I live as though I am the center of the world. And so do you. Instead of that, the Bible tells us to look to the interests of others. Be open to them. Not, not, on, not only in the overall direction of our lives, but also just in everyday stuff and actions. It's about how we treat our family, our neighbors, our work colleagues, and members of the church. About what's central to our conversations, central to our concerns, our thoughts, our giving, and our prayers. Selfish ambition, self-importance, and self-centeredness. Paul nails these things as wrong. Killjoys in their effect. He says we need a totally different attitude. Though the language he actually uses is that what we need is a totally different mind. A mind which operates in humility. I wonder if we know what that means. Humility. It's often a misunderstood term. A lot of people think humility means going around saying, I'm no good, I'm nothing, I'm a zero, I can't do anything right. But no, that's not humility. That's false humility. That's just degrading yourself. Listen, humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking of yourself less. Hear the difference? Humility doesn't mean running yourself down, which would be thinking less of yourself. Humility is you just don't think about yourself. You think about others, God and other people. The more you have your mind off yourself, the more humble you are. But the thing is, true humility like that does not come naturally to any human being. The fall into sin of the human race was the fall into I-centeredness, into being curved in on ourselves. And now, that's our nature. 
You know, if a, if a photographer walked in here and uh, took a whole bunch of pictures, you know, click, 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 all kinds of pictures of us all as a group, and later hands us a packet of all those pictures, what are you going to do when you get your packet? You're going to go through them and check each one to see how you look, right? Yeah. Uh, the ones where you look good, you'll figure that is a good picture. Uh, you might keep that one. The ones where you look funny, you know, you're picking your nose or you've been blocked by something, your eyes are closed, uh, you'll throw that one away. We all do that. We're eye-centered in things that don't matter, like a group photo, and in things that really do, like relationships. Humility does not come naturally to the fallen human nature. However, me just telling you that, or you just realizing that, even clearly, does not give you the power to overcome your nature. I could make it rhyme so you won't forget it. Never let pride be your guide. Always be humble or you'll stumble. Doesn't matter. Just knowing the right thing to do will not give you the power to do it. I remember years ago uh, watching the Olympics on TV. This was years ago. Watching it with my friend George. He's actually a pretty funny guy. Uh, we were watching the men's 10,000 meter race, something like that. Um, but I remember that after a number of laps, uh, the Canadian guy was about 40 yards behind the leaders who were all up front. He was way behind. And George said, see, this is frustrating. What the Canadians need to do is run at the front of the pack rather than way at the back. That way we'd get more medals. Okay. Right, George, thank you. Uh, thank you for that insight. The problem is, of course, not the insight, it's doing it. And everybody knows that if we're going to be happy, we need to be humble. The problem is doing it. Now, some are going to say, hang on. If that runner had wanted it more, if he tried harder, he could have been at the front of the pack. He could have won. And if I just really want to be humble, if I just want it more, and if I try harder to be humble, I'll succeed. Will you? Will you? What would that look like? Let's try to imagine. Here I am now making a big, big effort to be humble. I'm trying so hard to be humble. And I think my efforts are paying off. Look at me. I'm getting more humble. I'm succeeding. I'm winning at being amazingly humble. Obviously, this is ridiculous. Because the thing about trying to be humble is that you have to focus on yourself to do it. And that's going to kill all humility. You have to evaluate how you're doing by looking at yourself, which is actually being I-centered, puffed up with success of your efforts. Not actually humble at all, but you're being a proud idiot. Then what can be done? Well, remember this? Let's come back to this now, okay? The secret is to have our minds not on ourselves, that's I centered this. The secret is to have our minds not on ourselves, but on Christ, on Christ. In our gospel reading, Jesus used a particular image to talk about the reality of this with God. And it was the picture of a yoke. A yoke. Now, a yoke was a familiar object. Now, I don't mean a yoke like an egg yoke, okay? I'm talking about a wooden yoke. A yoke was a familiar object to people in his day, but not to us. What is it? A yoke is a big wooden bar that goes across the shoulders of an ox, or more commonly back then, across the shoulders of two oxen, joining them together. It was carved and shaped to have a hole for their heads and necks so that it rested comfortably on their shoulders. Two oxen joined by a wooden yoke pulling out a stump or two of them pulling a plow were way stronger and could get way more done than one ox by itself. Everybody back then knew this. And the secret to life, Jesus says, is for you not to live by yourself. You're going to get worn out by all kinds of things. You'll have way more strength, he says, if you're with me. He said, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. 
be yoked to Jesus. This is a description, not merely of following his example. This is way more than what would Jesus do, but it's an invitation to be in a very close relationship with him, to face all your challenges, whatever they are, in a yoke with him, including the challenge of your relationships with other people. Relationships, including the people we love the most, our marriages, our kids, and all the other relationships as well, at work, at church, they can be really challenging. I need hardly tell you, frankly, weighing us down, particularly when there's conflict. But Jesus says, don't face those challenges and don't carry that weight by yourself. Get into the yoke with me. And here's the thing. He's a big ox. A really big ox. Yoked to him, his strength to endure and his ability to move things will be yours. It'll be in your life. Yoke to him. You're in that yoke with the big ox, not by literally putting a piece of wood on your shoulders, but by trusting him without holding back and seeking closeness, intimacy with him. Imagine for a moment what it's like to have your head in one hole and a great big ox with his head in the other one. This yoke isn't made out of rubber, it's made out of wood. So that not only does the big ox do the heavy lifting in every situation, but when he turns his head, <laughs> you'll, you'll have to turn yours, you're yoked together, okay? When he walks one way, guess what? That's the way you're now walking as well. He's not only the strength, he's the brains, the leader. And you're now included in him with what he's doing. The yoke joins the two into one. And here's the thing. Not only is Jesus, the great ox, incredibly strong, able to change things and, sus and to sustain you in every situation so that you're not weary, but you're rested. He's also beautifully humble. Jesus is humble. The great ox is humble. Being that close to him, you'll feel his incredible love and affection for you. But you'll also be included in his attitude toward others and in his direction regarding your relationships. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. What did we say earlier? That pride brings conflict? Yes, but trusting Jesus' strength will bring you through it. And knowing his lowliness will bring you rest and direct you into harmony with him. I mean, in him. Natural pride will be overcome through the supernatural Christ in you. Humility, together with happy effects, will influence your relationships not by you trying harder on your own, but by you being in yoke with him, focusing on Jesus. I hope this is clear, that the yoke is not actually on your shoulders, it's in your mind. That's what we're talking about it. Your mind is joined to the mind of Christ. So, so just look and consider now, since your mind is joined to the mind of Christ, if you've trusted him, just look and consider what makes him tick. Listen to Philippians chapter 2, starting at verse 5. It was the second part of that reading we had. It says this. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. What makes him tick? Jesus considered your interests more important than his own. 
He's the Son of God. He's the maker of the universe. Who are you? He considered your interests more important than his own. Wow. He was interested in living and enjoying life. Of course he was. He loves the goodness of life and he hates death. However, you and I had a need to be saved from our sins and from their consequences. Separation from God and death. And so, this is the kind of person Christ Jesus is. In humility, he counted you more important than himself. And your interests more important than his own. How far did he take that? He laid down his life on a cross for yours. Ransoming with his innocent person your guilty, eye-centered self. Saving you from judgment, eternal death and the evil one, and delivering you to God's kingdom, to God's favor, and God's precious love. God's now raised Jesus from the dead, highly exalting him, and summoned you and me to be yoked to him in a new life, in a new life, dead to sin by being alive to Christ. With this Christ life, you know what, this Christ life, it's the real life. I know there's all kinds of advertising for different ways, things that are to give you life. What we're talking about here, this is the real life, the happy life, in which in Christ, with Christ, you look not only to your own interests, the dead end, but also to the interests of others. The really, really happy life. Amen. Now, may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus for life everlasting. Amen. Please rise. And let's Confess our faith in God using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. we continue with the prayer of the church. For the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs, let us bow our heads together and let us pray. God of mercy, you provide us with your holy word that we might know and believe in Christ. Make us diligent to study your word and dwell in your promises, that we may be content with your provisions in this life and joyful look, looking toward the life to come. We ask this in the name of Jesus, the living word, whose very presence transforms our in our relationships. We seek your face in all that we do and ask for your help in turning from our sinful ways. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. King of kings and Lord of lords, watch over the authorities of this and every nation. Deliver them from the idols of wealth and power and grant that they, 
would use their offices in service to you and those you have entrusted to their care. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Good and gracious God, we enter this new year of ministry seeking your guidance and direction. Be with your faithful people at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Warwick as they launch their Sunday school and Bible classes for children, youth, and adults. May your word take root and bear fruit for them and for the people of our congregation at St. James Lutheran Church and throughout our district. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, healer of our spirits and our bodies, we ask that you be with all those in need of your love and healing, including Bill Ermsher's mother, Jean Ermsher, who is in intensive care, and the family of Cindy Dorman, cousin of Liz Wagner, who is called home to the Lord. And those we now name before you aloud or in silence of our hearts. Grant them the comfort of your presence and healing according to your perfect will. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O oh Lord, we give thanks for your word and sacraments, that by the means of grace we may be kept in holiness and guarded from temptation and despair until the day when you bring all things to their perfect fulfillment and we are delivered to everlasting life. And we now joined together to pray as you have taught us. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be, be thy heaven. name. Thy kingdom, kingdom come, come. thy will be done, done on earth, earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, bread and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as, as we forgive, forgive those who trespass, trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, temptation but deliver but us from evil. evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You know, the, you've heard the words, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Do you know who said that? Jesus. Completely unnatural thing to, the, to, the, to a fallen human being. But when you're in yoke with Jesus, you find out it's true. You know, he, didn't, he considered equality with God not a thing to be grasped. He didn't grasp anything. He gave himself. He gave himself. And when we're in yoke with him, we find, oh, it's true. I have him who gave himself for me. I have everything in Christ. And the it's the happy life. It's the blessed life. More blessed to give than to receive. We, um, we practice that all the time and also in the offering at church. Um, the truth of that. Um, we declare it and we live it out. We, we receive an offering um, at church in the plates and the, out there or we give electronically. You can also use the QR code there. But let's join together now in the offertory prayer. It is our faith that brings us here, dear God. We bring these gifts as signs of our worship. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Holy Communion. What is Jesus saying? He's, he's, he's as much as saying, come to me, all you who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Be in communion with me. Be in com I am giving you me to be in communion with you. I'm giving you my body and blood, my everything. This is for you. Come, come and receive that. Be in that now. You know, if this sacrament, if, 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 if Holy Communion, it is a sacrament, but if it's only that, which ends in just a few minutes, well, that was good. But in fact, he's offering us more. Not, not only a sacrament, which has a beginning and an end, but a life, what has to be lived. A life of communion, yoked, 
a new life in Christ, in him. Let's come and be restored and renewed in that now. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Being obedient unto death, even death upon a cross. And given us life with him, new, now, happy, and everlasting. Evermore praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks gave it for all to drink, saying, take and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Peace be with you. 
take and eat. This is the true body of Christ given for you. Take and eat the very body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord Jesus given for you. Take and eat. This is the true body of Christ given in love for you. Take and eat. This is the true body of Christ our Savior given for you. Take and eat the very body of Jesus Christ our Lord given for you. Take and eat. This is the true body of Jesus Christ. body of Christ given for you. Take indeed the very body of the Lord Jesus given for you. Take indeed this is the true body of Christ given in love for you. Peace be with you. Take and eat. This is the true body of Jesus Christ given for you. Take and eat the very body of the Lord Jesus given for you. Take and eat. This is the true body of Christ given for you. Please rise and we'll sing together the post-communion canto. Thank the Lord and sing his praise. Tell everyone what he has done. Let everyone who seeks the Lord rejoice and proudly bear his name. He recalls his promises and leads his people forth. Shouts of thanksgiving, alleluia, alleluia. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. 
Amen. Please be seated for some announcements. Well, I have one announcement even before we get going here. Our new youth group leader, Paige Jelnick, is right there in the page. Would you please stand up so everybody can see Paige? Hello, yes. Yes, yes, applause for Paige. And um, youth group will be, next, our next youth group meeting will be this coming Friday at 7 o'clock, although the first 10 minutes are um, a quiz on what you've been doing in confirmation. And uh, for quiz followed by happy and fun uh, youth group with Paige. What other announcements did we got? Um, there is a soup pot in the Norfolk uh, for collections for the orphan grain trading. This, mon this money will go toward supplies for packing meals. The cost of supplies is $6,000. So any donation you can give is greatly appreciated. Also, we will be packing the meals on October 23rd after the 10 a.m. service. We need many volunteers as we are going to pack 20,000 meals for Kids Against Hunger and Orphan Grain Trains. Even we're impressed with that number. Yes. So that's a big number. <laughs> it is a big, a big number. People of all ages are welcome. Kids 10 to 99 will work on the assembly line and children nine and under will decorate the boxes and make drawings to put inside. Please sign up in the North X if you and your family can come, and pizza will be provided. Pizza? Pizza. Oh, well, well now I'm going to come. Yeah, absolutely. When there's food, <laughs> it's always good. Um, the St. James Lutheran Church booth at Saturday's Farmer's Market has raised us over $1,200 towards the purchase of food for the orphan grain chain. Thank you to everyone who stopped by. We will be there through the month of October, so if you hadn't had a chance to visit us, please stop by. And that's all I have, Pastor. So I am going to draw your attention to uh, announcements which are printed in the bulletin. Getting started class coming up. That is a great thing, but I'm, it's, it's printed nicely there. You just read that. The pause app, though, I am going to say something about. Um, I talked about this back in August. I'm going to talk about it again. The, today, today's, um, tonight's sermon about having a with God relationship. I didn't yoke with him. That will need to be sustained. Uh, it's sustained in the sacrament. It's sustained by coming to church. But then, now you've got to go another week till church is on. You need a prayer life of, of intimacy, which, which fosters intimacy with Jesus. And this pause app. I know it's different strokes for different folks, but I really think this is something that's going to help. Uh, people have, a number of people have tried this and said, this is working for me. It's, a, it, it, it's an app. And it leads you in a ten, what, 10 minutes of prayer at a time uh, to have intimacy with Jesus. And I like to recommend that you give it a try. Who doesn't like apps? People love apps. And there it is. And the instructions for doing it are right there in the, um, in the bulletin. Also, please notice a new men's group. Bible studies starting up. Um, that should be very, very interesting. Jim Peister is the leader of that, and I mentioned youth group. Those are our announcements. Let's please rise to sing our final hymn.
I found 